Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we're diving into the significant legislative changes shaking up local governance in Alberta. On Thursday, May 23rd, Minister of Municipal Affairs for the province of Alberta, Rick McIver, tabled long-awaited amendments to Bill 20, a piece of legislation poised to overhaul local elections, alter the Elections Act concerning political parties at the municipal level, and modify the Municipal Governance Act to grant the provincial cabinet the power to remove or amend municipal bylaws. Now, in an address to the Legislative Assembly during the Committee of the Whole period on May 23rd, Minister Rick McIver highlighted the feedback received from key municipal stakeholders, including Alberta municipalities, the rural municipalities of Alberta, and the Midside Cities Mayor Caucus. His speech underscored the necessity for greater clarity around the bill's provisions, particularly concerning the expedited process for dismissing councillors and the cabinet's authority to mandate changes to the municipal bylaws passed. So let's listen into a key part of that speech from Minister McIver. So since tabling Bill 20, I've had conversations with rural municipalities of Alberta, Alberta municipalities and mid-sized city mayors, caucus and other municipalities across Alberta. Through these conversations, they have indicated to me more clarity is needed around specific parts of the legislation. This includes the ability of cabinet to dismiss a councillor and the ability of cabinet to require a municipality to amend or repeal a bylaw. Uh, Madam Chair, while well, the province has always had the ability to remove a councillor through a ministerial process, so this is definitely not a new power. It was our intention to ensure that we were able to move more quickly in the exceedingly rare cases where a councillor needs to be removed due to a public breach of trust and potential harm to the community. I recognize the concerns of our municipal partners, and I've listened. Now, we sat down with Minister McIver on Friday, May 24th, to ask him about these amendments and some of the concerns that Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta still has around them. Minister, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly, uh, greatly appreciated of your time. Uh, yesterday in the Legislative Assembly, you uh, tabled the amendments to Bill 20 after a consultation period with stakeholders across the province. Uh, I want to first get your initial comments on how was the consultation process for yourself? Well, it was uh, it was good. It was over a couple of years. Um, I know I hear some people saying there was no consultation, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I tabled in the House uh, a couple, two consultations that are on our, our website now, uh, done last year. One was on the Municipal Government Act and the other one was on the Local Authorities Election Act, uh, full consultation reports on the, uh, on the website. So, uh, you know, the argument that no consultation was done just does not hold water. Um, Met, talked about this in speeches generally in general terms at least in speeches to the Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities association had some preliminary talks uh now listen there's some things that cropped up there's uh two or three things that uh, that weren't consulted on I acknowledge that but the vast majority of it was and but even on those two things we talked about what the municipalities would like differently we put uh amendments uh in the house now to recognize uh, at least in some way, the, uh, the changes that many municipalities said they'd like. So two of the biggest uh, amendments that were uh, amended in your uh, speech yesterday were around the removal of uh, councillors or mayors, local elected officials, and around bylaws. I want to start with the councillors for uh, the removal of a councillor, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. How did you come up with the amendment that you came up with? Who did you talk to? Were there conversations that you had internally with uh, staff or were there conversations that you had with residents or even municipal leaders? Yeah, well, I uh, talked to, uh, certainly talked to staff on a regular basis. Uh, <laughs> I had some a couple conversations with the, uh, 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 and some emails and such with the president of the Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta and the mid-sized cities and the uh, mayor of Calgary and, uh, and went back and forth and kind of formulated this after those conversations. So one of the key sticking points that two of the stakeholders that I spoke to today about this uh, was what does the Alberta government consider public interest for removing a municipal official to be? I know it's still early days. We're a day after the amendments were tabled. Yeah, no. But what, what do you consider public interest? Well, right in the amendment, a couple of the things are if there's uh, um, thing illegal activity, 
um, or uh, uh, essentially, I think it says something to the, I haven't got the amendment right in front of me, but something to the effect of immoral act, uh, activity. Um, and to be clear, there's room to further refine that in the regulations. And right from the outset, when I uh, put this legislation on the table, I committed that we would uh, consult with all the municipalities on the regulations, and there is, and I, I believe, room to further refine that in the regulations. But would the this... one thing that we did take out that seemed to be the biggest sticking point was, um, and, and to be clear, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit, Chris, is this is not a new authority. There is no new authorities in Bill 20. We've always, always, always had the ability to dismiss councillors, always had the ability to undo bylaws, always had the ability to undo land use uh, amendments. Um, so this is, I will acknowledge, a short, shorter pathway from thinking about it to doing it. But the power itself to do it is not new. But the one thing that they thought the shortcut was too much is that after a cabinet meeting in the initial draft of the legislation, cabinet could say, okay, whatever this councillor or mayor or Reeve has done is so horrendous, they need to be fired today. And we could make an announcement that that person is no longer elected today. And uh, a lot of municipalities said, well, that's just too fast. So we said, okay, all right. Um, so the other piece that we left in was that uh, if we decide that and it's serious enough extreme enough that we could call a vote of the uh, person of the of the people that elected that person in the first place and say we're having a vote on whether you should stay and not of uh, not by us in government by the folks that elected you in the first place and uh if they vote for you to stay you stay if they vote for you to go then we'll have a by-election you're, you're not elected anymore so that and again this is just for extreme cases and uh, listen I, one of the things that uh, people have said is that, well, uh, actually, some have said, well, we're okay with you making this decision. We don't know who the next government might be or who the next person might be. But I would say to you that, Chris, far be it from me to defend the NDP, but, but they would have the same problem I would have if I went out and said, Chris Brown, if you were elected, um, has done something really horrendous. So Chris, we're going to trigger a vote of the electors and they get to decide the one people that elected you get to decide again, whether you stay or go. Now, if you get 98% support, I don't know. I think my political career is over. <laughs> yeah. And, and the same would be true for the NDP. And I would, I would think that they would be held back by that same um, need to be credible if they were ever to make and listen uh it's it's only for extreme circumstances it's um uh, as it should be it shouldn't be easy to undo uh, uh the election of the certified election of a duly elected person and it should only be for extreme circumstances so i i think that uh again my political career would open be over if i was to try to do this flippantly and for no good reason i think the uh any NDP person ever in the future, some other party tried that, their their political career would go over too. So, and I don't think any person of any future government would do this lightly. The so public wouldn't stand. I just want to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you, don't if for a second, if you don't please, mind, Minister. Do, but yes. um some would say that you already have these powers, which you have openly yep. said on the show numerous times. Yeah. Some will say you have used the power to remove uh, elected officials, yeah. even here in, uh, not here in Calgary, but in Chestermere, you uh, yeah. fired literally four councillor, three councillors and a mayor. What is the difference between this legislation and what you did in Chestermere? Because there, there would this have been an easier way for you to remove those councillors and the mayor in Chestermere if these powers well, I'm were not in gonna, place? I'm not going to talk about that because that could end up in court. I'm not going to comment okay. on that. But I will say that if, if a person was to read what's on our website uh, about that process that took two years, yeah. almost two years, they, some might say, wow, um, to do this in some cases shouldn't have to take that long. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, there is reason to at least have a, a another lever for extreme circumstances to make things happen faster. And again, it, this would only be for extreme circumstances. The current 
program to dismiss counselors that has been used in the past is still there. Um, and we, as you say, we used that process a few months ago. Um, the NDP and previous governments had used it as well. Pardon me? Previous governments have used it as well. You're not the first or you NDP won't be the used last. It when they were in government, uh, that decision got overturned by the courts. And that's another kettle of fish. But the mm -hmm. fact is, uh, they felt it was necessary to use it once. And um, so we found it necessary to go through that process just once. So I want to turn to the bylaw amendment as well, because uh, there are a few municipalities who I have spoken to over the last few weeks uh, since we last chatted about potential of this giving centralized control to the cabinet or to the uh, provincial government on all things related to municipalities. Um, again, you talk about the provincial interest oh. and in your comments that we've done in our previous interview, you talked about how Edmonton introduced a mass bylaw during COVID yeah. and the government had to overturn it. Is there another area where you have looked at besides Edmonton, where you say this was outside of the, uh, the uh, municipal interest and that's why we need to step in or is Edmonton the only example that you have? No, no, there's another example before the house right now. Um, and that we just passed uh, a uh, a uh, piece of legislation undoing Calgary's extreme electricity taxation on their citizens. Now, the our uh, affordability minister uh, Newdorf talked to the city of Calgary, and the city of Calgary promised to uh, amend that, correct it, if you will, the severely high electricity taxes. And then they went in and passed a bylaw to amend it, effective twenty twenty seven. After so, our minister said, "No, no, no. That not that isn't in the spirit of what we asked you to do." So we put a piece of legislation in to end that at the end of this year, not two years after that. So there's another example, and and okay. uh, I think most people would say that was the proper use of the authority, um, and that's what it needs to be reserved for only when the proper use. And again, or people say, well, all this, when people say all this new power, we've always had the power to overturn bylaws, always had the power to dismiss people. It's rarely used. Um, and hopefully it'll be rarely used in the future. Um, mm -hmm. No, nobody wants, nobody, nobody wants control over 300 municipalities, nobody in their right mind anyways. Um, so you have tabled the amendments. Uh, this government is hoping that the third reading will be done by next, by the time the House rises on May 30th, hopefully, right. and that's a big hope because yeah, their things could change. Um, Alberta Municipalities is calling for another round of consultations around these new amendments. Will you sort of pledge to have that conversation with President Gandam or even members of Alberta Municipalities and well, or even uh, Paul McLaughlin? Listen, and we, were, we were in, we were, I was having consult ad consult uh, some conversation with the president of Alberta municipalities and uh based on that he went in front of the media and said no the, the you know the bills not you shouldn't don't want to get rid of the bill there's a couple things you want to change and uh he was uh, aware that we were contemplating changing those things and that's largely what's in the amendment and something or someone changed his mind so they've taken the position they don't want any of it so we will still we will we will keep our commitment to include them in the uh, full consultation on the uh, regulations. So but the, uh, our, our, the, the amendment such as we have decided to do or before the house now, if uh, we're hopeful that the house will pass those and pass the legislation. And then we, this summer we'll get into the, uh, reg the uh, regulations and municipalities will have another chance to try to affect how this all uh happens in 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 the real world uh in their life but let me be clear i believe that for the municipalities in alberta if bill 20 passes their life the day after it passes will be pretty much exactly like it was the day before it passes can you guarantee that though yeah, pretty much. Unless, again, it's uh, the the biggest things that people are uh, uh, unhappy about are these things that we already can do, and there, there's just a shorter path towards doing them. But uh, yeah, but if you're asking me if I'm planning on uh, firing one or 10 or 20 mayors, reeves, or councillors the day after, the answer is a hard no. Not even considering it, not even thinking about it. 
hoping it doesn't happen, hoping it doesn't have to happen. So I, I have one last question before I ask you about housing, because I know that's another big part of Bill 20, which you and this government have been talking about. Paul McLaughlin is on the record because he literally just talk, spoke to him before this interview. And he said, yeah. if the province removed the words public interest and provincial interest, I would be a good boy and I would fall in line behind the provincial government. Would you be willing to remove those four words to make RMA's nope. life a little I bit talked easier? To President, I talked to President Paul yesterday and I said, you know what, we need to sit down when we uh, do the regulations and see if you can put some limits around that to make you more comfortable. And that's uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Awesome. You know what? Uh, go ahead. He's a, the president, Paul, of the rural municipalities is allowed to disagree with me. President Tyler of the Alberta AB Munis is allowed to disagree with me. Heck, everybody's allowed to disagree with me. Uh, we've 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 uh, committed to including the municipalities in the regulations. We will. They'll have another chance to uh, make things more to their liking. And and I expect I hope that we have a mutually respectful conversation. That's certainly my intention. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to land in a place that everybody says okay. But at any rate, I I'm very very sure that municipalities' life, if this passes the day after, will be exactly like it was the day before. So I want to talk about housing for a second, if you don't mind, and because I know Bill 20 does introduce a few things around housing and getting more housings built, because we are in a housing yep. crisis in this country and even in this province. Um, what in this bill are you most proud about when it comes to housing and getting more housing built? Well, I, th I think the uh, cooperative uh, way that we uh, intend to work with municipalities, uh, and, and they have I, I don't know of any of this said they don't want to build more affordable housing. I would, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say every single one of them does. Anyone that doesn't, it would probably only because they are in one of those rare spots in Alberta that maybe has enough housing. Um, Fort McMurray can you, might can be in you that. introduce Fort, Fort, McMurray, to Fort McMurray might be in that condition now because of uh, uh, because I think they have, might actually have more housing than they need in some cases now because of how the economy there has changed in the last couple of years. But I'm, I, but, he, but if the mayor says different than that, that we need more affordable housing, then believe the mayor and not me. Okay. But uh, having said that, that might be the rare example, but I think pretty much any other municipality that gets a chance to build more affordable housing, I would say uh, is interested in doing it. And, and, uh, and I'm not given the final word on Fort McMurray either. If they say they want more affordable housing, then we'll, we'll do our best to help them build it. So, but some of the things we're doing is we're going to uh, exempt the new affordable housing projects from uh, property tax, both municipal and provincial property tax, which uh, should cost make the cost per door, the cost per square foot, the cost per whatever other way you measure it, less expensive to build that affordable housing. And, and not only uh, from the construction standpoint, but probably equally important from the operating standpoint so that whatever rent people are paying, uh, it will have an opportunity to be less because there will not have to be an element of that rent supporting property tax. Now, I know I said that was my last question, but I got you and I need to ask this question because literally we are on the heels of a major conference here in Calgary, Alberta next week from June 6th to June 9th. Uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities will be meeting in Calgary to discuss municipal issues from across Canada and they're descending. Yeah. We have leaders from across Canada descending upon it. FCM has been calling for the provincial governments and the federal governments to meet with municipalities to talk about a new fiscal framework. Would you be in favor of a new fiscal framework for municipalities to allow them to better serve their residents or would you be looking for the devils in the details well the devil's always in the details but to be clear chris we just put a new fiscal framework in in uh, place as of april 1st this year so the new fiscal framework that it's pretty much exactly what municipalities asked for is less than 60 days old okay we've yeah. already done that now municipalities, if they were on this phone call with us and some will be watching you and listening, they'd say, yeah, but we want more money. Okay, that means it's a day that ends in Y. And, and I'm not offended by that. I was a municipally elected person for nine years and there wasn't a single day out of those nine years that I didn't want more money from the provincial government. And if municipalities have a day when they don't want more money from the provincial government, it means they're not paying attention that day. But that, I've never seen that day yet. They always want more money. It's their job. I'm not offended by it. I, I, I uh, we're open to uh, you know mutually respectful conversations about that, about who and how and why and when and where and how much. 
all those things. And uh, we're open to those conversations. And, and just for the record, I had uh, a representation, at least from the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities board in my office within the last seven days. And we had a nice, respectful conversation about these things as well. Now, to delve deeper into the implications of these amendments, we spoke with Councillor Andrew Knack, who also serves as the Director of Cities Over 500,000 for Alberta Municipalities. In our conversation, he shared his insights on the changes and the issues he believes remains unresolved in the amendments that were put forward. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Bill 20 amendments were tabled on May 23rd. Uh, the reaction from Alberta municipality seems disappointing, to say the least, from the news releases that have been coming across. You, I, From our brief conversation prior to uh, the interview, you are with your colleagues right now with Alberta municipalities. What's the general consensus there right now? Yeah, I think, I think that's why the statement talks about being disappointed, because the amendments, uh, number one, don't even address the problems of those two parts of the legislation. And more importantly, all of the other issues that have been raised over the last well, month, really, since this was first unveiled, uh, aren't at all being addressed. So the things that Albertans said they didn't want, political parties, the th things like reintroducing corporate and union donations, these are all things that Albertans have been very clear about not wanting. And yet there's no amendments to address those and like I say, even the few amendments that exist, I, I think are actually still quite flawed when you think about the intent and the purpose of it. So uh, all in all, uh, really disappointing that, that really over the last month, there's been almost no real change. And I would suggest no real engagement with anyone. I, I heard the minister on the legislature floor yesterday. I've watched, watched it as he introduced those, suggesting that he's tried to do engagement. Well, he's had a two-minute phone call with the president of Alberta municipalities. He's had a bunch of phone calls with, you know, folks. Uh, and, but more importantly, you know, a couple minutes on the phone, that's not engagement. That's a quick conversation. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have a longer discussion now than the ministers had with the president of Alberta municipalities in the last sort of three weeks. And, and then think about Albertans as a whole. And that's sorry, just the last point is that uh, this is legislation that affects the voice of Albertans in their local democracy. And there has been zero engagement with them beyond the online survey, which showed they don't want this. So we're going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you for a second, uh, Councillor, Director of, uh, of uh, Cities un over 500,000. <laughs> Apologize. Yeah. They said they have been doing consultations. I'm waiting to hear back from the minister of what consultations they have been talking about, whether it is just with Alberta municipalities or if it was, is with member communities. Um, what actual consultations are you looking for as an organization? Are you actually looking for a longer than two minute conversation? Are you looking to actually sit down with the minister and the premier? Is there a tangible thing that you are looking for from this government? Because the amendments have been tabled, second reading, they're going to do some more consultations before third reading in uh, Royal Assent. What, what is Alberta municipalities looking for in the next few weeks until this potentially gets passed? I, I think it is fair to ask for more than a two minute phone call. I think it's fair to say, come sit down with the board of directors who have developed a series of recommendations on how to actually improve fairness and transparency in local elections. And, and even though those were submitted well in advance, there's no acknowledgement of those. There hasn't even been an acknowledgement saying, yes, we received them. We're not going to do them. And here's why. It's not even a, a basic acknowledgement. So, so I think that's that's the type of thing that that I think really helps breed cynicism because, you know, in, in municipal government, we can't do all of that behind closed doors. We can't sort of avoid the public. When we're creating a bylaw, there's a public meeting. Now, not everyone registers to speak when you come to certain bylaw meetings, but we actually give people the chance to, to speak their mind, share their perspectives, raise questions that they think maybe their elected representatives should be asking. And, and I think it's very reasonable to expect the minister when you're developing legislation that is going to overhaul how your local democracy works, that you both engage with local elected representatives who have developed real solutions. And I, I'm gonna keep going back to more importantly, there needs to have been some type of engagement with the public. You know, even a telephone town hall would have been better than what we had. We had a single online survey 
and there has been nothing since then. How is that possible when every municipality, when we do ward boundary reviews in the city of Edmonton, we have an independent citizen commission that gets formed. They do academic research. They do other research. They engage Edmontonians, and then they come forward with recommendations. We do that for something as important as ward boundary reviews. This is changing far more than what how ward boundaries work when it comes to local democracy. And we haven't even seen the minister do that, which I, I think is the most disappointing aspect of this. So you have been, and I'm, I'm going to kind of paraphrase here, so I apologize. And if you want to correct me, please correct me. But you have been an outspoken sure. critic about this bill since its implement, implication, it, it, since its announcement, sorry, back in April. But you've also taken to social media to sort of uh, foil some of the rumors that are going around about this bill and how it could potentially impact or why it's needed. And the reoccurring theme that I find on social media that you have sort of been talking about is you're just upset because you're an incumbent and it's just changing the rules that you don't like. So how do you respond and how should members of Alberta, Alberta's municipalities respond to those allegations that it's just, you're just upset that the, the provincial government is doing what's in their authority to do. I think the most important thing is to use facts. So one of the facts that I shared, uh, and I, I actually broke down the numbers from the Edmonton municipal election and over the previous four municipal elections. So the three, uh, 2010, 2013, 2017, which all allowed corporate union donations, and then the 2021, which didn't allow corporate union donations. And what I found is that in the previous three elections, when corporate and union donations were allowed, the average winning campaign for city councilor, not including mayor, was about $72,000. That was the average amount raised by the winning candidate for city council. In 2021, when corporate and union donations were, were prohibited, the average winning campaign was $38,000. So about half of the average. So th that's why I often say the point you know, if you hate me, reintroducing corporate and union donations is something you shouldn't want because it gives me an advantage. Because time and time again, corporate and union donations have benefited those who currently sit in the position, not those who are trying to get into the position. So there's a great example of that. And I think the other important piece that, that we often talk about is forget who the government is today. Right, because maybe you like the UCP and you don't like your city councillor. What if the roles were reversed and you had an NDP government in 2027 and a city councillor that you really love? The way the legislation is written, including around the removal of the councillor, even with the amendments, still allows cabinet behind closed doors to make the decision to send that to essentially a referendum to remove the councillor. So while it's still technically up to the people in that municipality, the decision that would trigger that vote will still be done in secret. And therefore, would you be comfortable with that if the UCP was in government? Would you be comfortable with that if the NDP was in government? And if the answer to either of those is no, then you should be uncomfortable no matter who's in power. Are you surprised about the amendment that allows the cabinet to force a recall vote on a councillor or mayor? Because that was the one surprising takeaway that I took away from the amendments that were put forward was the cabinet now would be able to say, OK, we're going to have a recall vote and it's not going to be by a written petition. It's going to be we're going to just allow it from a cabinet perspective. This gives control to the cabinet in a way that this power did not exist three three months ago or five years ago. And the minister and even this government has been saying all these powers have been part of the provincial government already this one kind of wasn't correct and, and, it, and it essentially and we've even heard the minister very clearly talk about how there are the only guardrail that to ensure this won't be abused is public opinion that's that's not acceptable when you're talking about taking away albertans voice on their local democracy uh, so, and I think why I'm surprised about the amendments is that, again, remember, this isn't just something that Alberta municipalities has opposed. This is something that RMA has opposed, the rural municipalities of Alberta. And, include, and their comments yesterday, even after these amendments were released, is that it's still missing the mark from them. So you still have the two 
municipal organizations that represent every municipality in this province saying, you've missed the mark. You didn't actually listen to anyone when you said you went and consulted. And, and so again, that feels like it should serve as a wake up call to the minister to say, listen, you still have the same group saying no. You still have Albertans saying no. Why, why are you so passionate about pushing forward in this spring session? What, like at this point, you know, and while I wouldn't love it, love it like in Ontario when they, I think, changed the number of wards three months before the election, they do have a fall sitting. Like, let's take the summer break. We all share the same, at least I believe we share all share the same goals. I hear the minister say he wants more fair and transparent elections. I, I do as well. These, this bill does nothing to actually make elections more fair and transparent. And I would argue makes them far less fair and transparent based off actual data. So why don't we just take a couple of months, go work together, hold some town halls with Albertans, get the municipal organizations to help you with that, and let's create a great piece of legislation that will make the election in 2025 truly more fair and transparent and better for everyone. Why not do that? But I think it's because they're actually not interested in that. Because if, if they were genuinely interested in that, they would have taken the time already to go and step back. But they are, they are more concerned about getting this through than actually listening to the folks that elected them in the first place. What would you want to say to Rick McIver if you had two minutes on the phone with him right now? I would say... Mr. McIver, I, I spoke with you at the spring MLC in Edmonton about this bill when you had spoken to municipal leaders. And I asked you, would you be okay with Alberta municipalities trying to come up with recommendations on how to actually help you achieve the goals that you've talked about? And while he didn't say no to me, he didn't, rather, while he didn't say yes, he didn't say no specifically. So that to me left the door open for us as an organization to go and try to develop ideas on how to make things better. We submitted it to their office, to Minister McIver and Premier Smith, never heard back. Why? why? Why are you seemingly unwilling to engage with municipal elected representatives, the organizations that serve these members, and most importantly, Albertans? Why? Why are other ministers doing telephone town halls? Why are other ministers doing community meetings on important legislation? And you're not on something as important as the fundamental changes to how local democracy works. That's what I would wanna ask him because he came from municipal government. He knows the importance of local democracy. He knows how unique local democracy is compared to provincial and federal politics. And, and yet he, he's actually been on the legislature floor I, and I use the term and I, I will stand behind it outright lying. And, and that's not the person I thought I knew. I thought I knew a straight shooter who I wouldn't always agree with, but I respected because at least he would tell you, Hey, I'm not going to agree with you on this. You're not, not going to be happy with me. And here's, but here's why we're going to do it. And here's the thought process that went into it. Here's how we came to this decision. This bill hasn't had any of that. This is not the Rick McIver I thought I knew. And, and, and that's what I think, well, it's not the most disappointing thing. The most disappointing thing is Albertans are going to have a less of a voice in their local democracy. But I, I, I must admit, as somebody who had a lot of respect for Minister McIver, I'm really confused as to why he's uh, approaching this differently. And, and again, you can look at me as the big city councillor. Oh, you're just from Edmonton. Go talk to all of the other councillors in municipalities that overwhelmingly voted for UCP who are saying the same thing. So why aren't you listening to them? Fine, don't listen to me, but why aren't you listening to them? Okay, so hypothetically, and this is a big hypothetical here, but consultations don't take place. Bill 3 passes, or Bill 20 passes, third reading gets royal assent. By the summer, that means there's going to be changes literally this summer going into the next election what what happens now 
Is, is it going to be a tough year for municipalities trying to navigate these new changes, not only with Bill 20, Bill 21, Bill 22, Bill 18? Like, it seems like it's a tough year to be a municipal leader right now, whether you're from Edmonton like yourself, or even while I was talking to uh, Mayor Barry uh, Kaletke from Torshu, sorry, uh, this morning, it seems like a lot of municipal leaders are kind of in a weird spot right now with all these non-consultation bills that are coming out. Yeah, th this this raises that bigger question about wh what changed that the provincial government has decided to centralize the decision-making authority within them. Uh, and, you know, I, I've heard the premier sort of answer that question because she was asked probably about four weeks ago, well, you know, you're sort of criticizing the federal government that's doing this uh, about why they're trying to do that to provinces, yet you're doing the same thing to municipalities. And at a high level, her paraphrasing her answer was sort of like, well, legally we can, which they're right. I mean, truly they can. But I thought they were interested in being partners, not parents. And if we're going to have a successful province that continues to attract hundreds of thousands of people because of the amazing things that are happening within municipalities across this province, why can't we work as partners? What, what, what has changed that you feel that the provincial government knows best? And, and if that's really where you want to go, why go through the charade of, of trying to say, ah, oh, this will make things more fair and more competitive elections. Just go and appoint the councillors you want. I, I mean, really, you can do that. So if, if that's what your goal is, be upfront with everyone. Maybe there's people who will be fine with that. But, but tell the truth that, you're, that that's what you're interested in. And if, if that's genuinely not what you're interested in, why aren't you taking the time to engage with municipal leaders, with, elect, with Albertans, more importantly, on really important fundamental changes to how local democracy works. So that's that's the biggest concern I have with this is that these bills, this combination of bills is changing things it's so dramatically. And we've even seen on the legislature floor, they've limited debate to all, all of those bills to one hour. I mean, again, I sort of, you know, I, I laugh in a depressing way uh, of, uh, I mentioned in my 10 years on council, we've never done anything like that. Why? Because it's too important to try to just circumvent the democratic debate that can happen, the different ideas that you can hear that can help make better legislation. You still might not agree with it at the end, but you then heard everyone, you've understood different perspectives. And, and, and you know, this runs contrary to the premier's own comments just two years ago. There are videos circulating of her talking about the importance of local government and how she sort of longs for that more provincially and again, I have no problem with somebody changing their mind, but why did her mind change? She's never talked about that. That's, that's, that's what's troubling in all of this. And that, again, in all of this, Albertans have not been involved in this conversation. Before I let you go, I have one final question. And give me a silver lining here, Councillor. Give me a silver lining that what, we, what we're seeing right now is not all doom and gloom, as some people are saying. Is there anything good that has come out of the last month that you think? Or is it all a challenge right now to be a municipal leader? I'm typically known as the hopeful and optimistic guy that that's, so let's that's be hopeful and thing. optimistic. <laughs> uh, the, the old, the challenge is I'm, I'm scraping to find that hope right now. I, I, I'll say this is that I, I am surprised in a pleasant way of over the last four weeks, I've had far more people at random community meetings talk about legislation that the, uh, the provincial government, like Bill 20 to me, than ever before. Now, they're frustrated. They're upset about it. But the fact is, at least they're paying attention to it. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful in that sense that, that people uh, are paying attention and, and won't forget this. This is part of the game that often happens provincially and federally. It's not just a UCP thing. The NDP did it when they're in government. Liberals do it in federal government. So they always try to you know, break, hammer through these really bad pieces of legislation within their first year, maybe first two years, in hopes that people will forget at the end. And I hate that that game exists in, in partisan politics because it doesn't really exist municipally. Uh, 
But I, I, I think what it will do is it will, remind, it will make people remember the importance of being involved in the political process, not just at the election time, but throughout. Um, but, but truly, I am less hopeful when it comes to Albertans having a voice in their local democracy. I, I don't think there's any way you can look at these, these numerous bills that have just been uh, that are going to be rammed through really in the next week and say, oh, yes, this this there, there's something we should try to pull hope out of. Yeah, there's a few changes in Bill 20, like mandatory council training that I think would be good. But like you shouldn't be saying, oh, well, that's a reason to keep going forward or, or like have hope. There, there's so many other things that actually remove the voices of Albertans that that we shouldn't some, sometimes, even even as an eternal optimist, you shouldn't always try to find the good in everything when there is so much bad. Um, and, and more importantly, that the process to get here was done without actually involving the people who are going to be most directly impacted. That's the part that troubles me more than anything is the province was willing to go around Albertans and not engage with them about something this fundamental. We also got the perspective of President Paul McLaughlin of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, who offered his insights and reactions to the amendments and discusses the ongoing challenges that municipalities will face with these proposed bills. Paul, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting an update from our last conversation last Friday. Uh, you were hoping for amendments to Bill 20. Bill 20 amendments were tabled on May 23rd. What was your initial reactions from RMA's perspective? Well, you know, I'd be disingenuous to say that I hadn't been heard. Uh, I think that 75% of those amendments, uh, especially specifically what we've keyed in on, is amendments related to uh, you know uh, elimination of a counselor and bylaws and and we wanted to my conversation with Minister McIver was to make sure we put some guardrails around it and, and he's he's done so and I think I've been heard from that portion um, so like I said probably about seventy five percent of my discussions with him he's addressed the problem that we're having is that last twenty five percent nullifies the seventy five percent and as much as is that we have concerns related to interpretation of the term public interest. Uh, and I have, have, and that's related to relating to to eliminating a counselor or, or uh, uh, moving a counselor on. Public interest is so hard to define. Uh, conversations you and I've had. Uh, there's 40 different ways to define it. Uh, and the other piece that we're concerned about is relates to bylaws, uh, because it's Alberta provincial policy. Um, that is a wide door um, on, from the bylaw standpoint. And and it's interesting. I was having this conversation with my wife, and she said. Does everybody that watch Chris's show, are they, you know, are they all into politics? And I said, likely they are. And she said, you probably got to explain this a little better for folks that don't understand. And so the government has at present has the authority through cabinet uh, to, to disqualify a, a municipal councillor. And those mechanisms exist. Um, the attempt by McIver is to create clarity around that. And what's happened is actually done the opposite. And in fact, um, something that should be hard should be kept hard. And Minister McIver uh, in this situation has actually opened up the door in some ways has weaponized a disqualification of a counselor. And, and I've actually had this conversation. I said, what this government's done inadvertently is created 1-800-I-hate-my-counselor, where they've actually got a mechanism that they can actually, I'd go to my MLA and say, hey, you know what? I don't like Paul McLaughlin, uh, Reeve of Pinocchio County. Um, you need to get rid of him because he's not working in the public interest. Um, the question would be is, what is the public interest? Uh, you know what, he's made some decisions that we don't like. And so we're the public, so therefore they're not meeting our interests, so eliminate them. And I mean, I'm sounding, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm sounding frivolous on this, but that is literally how broad that interpretation could be. Um, and the same on the bylaw component. The provincial government could create policy that uh, doesn't make any sense, uh, doesn't match really, uh, you know, standard operation procedures of municipalities. And so I think that what he's done is, He's addressed my the first part of my issues, and then he's done the yeah but part of of uh, legislation, saying and in all other instances we we'll, we can do this anyways because we'll find this piece. He's basically baked a loophole into it, which has really uh, given tremendous power to a future government that I don't know who they are, but uh, they could be a monster. 
you, we, let's talk about the bylaw part for a brief second, because I know that was a big sticking point for yourself, counselors uh, aside for a second, but for the bylaw perspective. Uh, so these amendments have been tabled now. We're going into a consultation period again before the final bill, before the bill is finally passed for third reading and given royal assent. Are you hoping to have one last conversation to try and get that, but yeah, part of the conversation out of this uh, negotiation and get the bill at least 90% of in favor for the RMA? I'm sure hopeful and I'm always optimistic, but sometimes I'm not optimistic to the point of naivety. Um, I know amendments go into the big uh, legislation machine and the legislation machine spits something out. And so, again, Minister McIver went down the path and started putting some guardrails on. And then that yeah, but got put in. And what I'm concerned about is that yeah, but is being driven by someone else. It's being driven by another motive, uh, which is to put us in a tiny box as it relates to, to municipal bylaws. And, and I will state this quite clearly since 1952, uh, Pinocchio County has never made a bylaw that's outside of our box. We've stuck within our lane the whole time. Uh, we're, the, we're the third county that was created in, in, in Alberta. And uh, rest assured, without even doing any deep binding, uh, every single bylaw that Pinocchio County has made is within our lane as municipal, uh, municipal politics and, and within our jurisdiction. So the hard part is, is that, you know, what's being gestured by this government is that, that there's something nefarious going on. It's a signal. And, and the one thing I, I do want to bring up, Chris, um, given the time, is, is I've done a tour and, and met with a lot of my members in the last little while. And I'll, I'll tell you, we are being inundated with conspiracy theories of Agenda 21, World Economic Forum, 15-minute 15, 15 cities. This is a time when we actually need this government to support us, not to actually um, say there's a fire where there is none. And I think that these two pieces of legislation um, uh, that these two pieces of this legislation are really um, actually uh, could be could be construed as actually there's there's issues with councillors. There's issues with bylaws being created by municipalities. It's a horrible time in considering that the folks that I represent are just being inundated by um, um, tremendous outcry of these conspiracies. That is a small component of the population, but it's really affecting our land use planning process and our decision making process. I I just from the coverage that I've been doing over the last few months over the last year, uh, you talk about land use bylaw and you talk about planning. Uh, Clearwater County had a very contentious meeting about 15 minute cities. Uh, are you saying that is sort of creeping out in not just Clearwater County, but across the uh, province right now in your other member municipalities? Well, I've met with uh, six of my member municipalities in the last two weeks, and uh, we're at 100% for six, and none of them was Clearwater. So um, this is this is something that is a critical issue for municipal um, authority, municipal planning authority. Um, it's occurring, uh, and I would probably venture to say that I wouldn't be surprised if it's occurring in every municipality. And, and the key issue that I have is that I've had an MLA quote me um, complete misinformation that was fed by by these conspiracy theories and land use bylaws. And uh, I'm really concerned where this is coming from. And and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist about conspiracies. But when, I, when I'm at 100 percent for six municipalities saying that they are having uh, consistent issues with folks believing that we're tapped into WEF and Agenda 21 and and all these other bigger issues that are, that are being sort of made up. Um, we're in a pretty tough spot right now, and this is the time that we need uh, the provincial government to assert our authority as opposed to actually question our authority, which is what's being done in Bill 18. So during the during the uh, uh, introduction of the amendments to Bill 20, uh, Minister McIver did say that he did consult with rural municipal, uh, the RMA. Um, in our last conversation, you said uh, it was consultation through media. Did you have a conversation with the minister since the last time we spoke and prior to the introduction of these amendments? Yeah, I, I would never say Minister McIver does not communicate with me directly. He does 100% and has always been uh, very truthful and, and forward um, as it relates to sharing information with me. Um, and and I've, I've told him the concerns that I have, especially with the two components that we've talked about, um, that being public interest and in, in, uh, provincial policy. And so he's aware of that. But yes, we, we've had those discussions. Again, going back to the conversation around consultation, um, has there been consultation on Bell 18? 
uh, by any de definition that I have on consultation, that hasn't occurred. And and uh, and that's when that happens. That's when you start having debate by media instead of debate by a, a boardroom table. So um, I think moving forward, and a lot of people have been asking me, what next? Um, you know what? We're getting, we're the adults in the room. Uh, this government could push through these three bills that are are have tons of issues with them um, in many different forms. Um, and I think that uh, we're going to push forward, be the adults in the room. I'm going to continue to do the job that I need to do, which is is uh, make sure that the people in rural Alberta are represented and uh, ensure that the people that I represent uh, have a voice. And uh, I'll never walk away from the table, but uh, we're walking into an I told you so scenario, much as we did with recall legislation. When the recall legislation came in, we said this will be weaponized. This is going to be a political issue. You shouldn't do this. The government proceeded to do this, and it was weaponized, and it's become a political issue. I'm telling you right now that these those two pieces, um, eliminating the counselors and the bylaw component, these are going to be an issue. They're going to be weaponized, and I'm going to be in an I told you so scenario going forward. How much do you win in I told you so's? I obviously haven't been winning much in those scenarios. Would you rather be talking about unpaid oil and gas tax right now? Um, yeah, you know, bridges, unpaid oil and gas taxes. Wow, this this government's had uh, a good four months to stoke on unpaid oil and gas taxes, but they sure worked hard on Bill 18 and, and uh, Bill 20 and have seen no movement from this government on unpaid taxes. So, uh, yeah, wouldn't we? Uh, I'd love to sit around a table and let's talk about the future of, of assessment. I'd like to talk about the future of, of agricultural land assessment. We are working through assessment model review, but at the same time, let's talk about those companies that are not paying their taxes and uh, and let's find those solutions. Let's talk about bridges. Let's talk about building resilient infrastructure uh, instead of talking about who got who I can't talk to and uh, how if I don't do things right, I'm going to get smacked around, kicked out, or I'm going to have bylaws rescinded uh, outside of me. So what a waste of energy and time of a sitting of government from a municipal standpoint, not dealing with the issues we've been asking for. What would you want the average Albertan, I say average respectfully, but the the Albertan to know about what's going on right now with the municipalities in the face of these bills that have been introduced? You know, your neighbors and friends have elected um, elected someone to represent your community at the, at the most local level. We work as a council on the municipal boundary level. We work to, for the good of our community. Um, those folks don't have an easy job. But they're there for you and they're there for the community and they're and they're providing public service. They need to be respected and they need to be protected. And we need to realize that um, that local government is the most effective form of government that affects you on, a, on a, every single day. And when another level of government tries to take the authority and, and the, uh, the ability of that government to best represent you, um, that starts to steer away from the representative democracy that we've all been around. And I think that these folks need your help. They need your respect. And if this government punches through these three bills, um, I hope they have a great summer, um, shaking hands and in parades, and ask them big questions on how much respect they have for municipal government. Because what's being reflected right now is not a lot of collaboration, not a lot of partnership, and definitely uh, definitely not a lot of respect for what we do day to day on behalf of all of, all of Albertans. And with a rural focus, Chris, um, I will say that anybody that's rural um, you have the potential of a very, very, very possible future that the, the authority of your uh, rural government uh, at the municipal level can be constrained by a future monster government minister or decisions made at cabinet that will be drastically affect the ability of your local government to protect rural Alberta. So um, I think that we're in a bit of a crisis here that we need to really talk about on what government should be allowed to do and not do. And I think we need to shift more power to local government, not less. And this government's doing the opposite. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. If you enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all the diverse content that we have coming to you over the month of June and into July. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you can back the show, consider it by making a small or large contribution. Every donation goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today, or in the show notes, there will be a link. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.